office. So let me grab my stuff here. And um, yeah, let's just spend a couple minutes unpacking um, a few thoughts here. Not having ever done a Christmas, um, man, that's true, babe. Have I ever done a Christmas Day message? I don't know if I've ever preached this Christmas Day message. Oh, that's exciting. All of a sudden, I didn't even think about that. Um, yeah, typically we, typically we would be at another church Christmas Day, uh, just kind of sitting and basking and kind of leaning into what God would want to say to us. And uh, so it's a cool opportunity this year to get to share with you guys, um, uh, yeah, during this Christmas Day time. Because typically the dwelling hasn't. You know, we don't own this building. We rent this building. We trailer in, trailer out each Sunday and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but being on a Sunday, it's just kind of cool how this all works. So let's pray if that's okay. Well, actually, let me read the scripture I want to look at first. If you have your Bibles, uh, open up to Colossians. Now that doesn't sound super Christmas story -y, But open up to Colossians. Um, and I'll be honest with you, if you're kind of like one of those who'd like to hear the Christmas story, which I'm a big fan of on Christmas Day, I'd encourage you to read that at home with your family. Uh, go open up to Luke chapter 2 or Matthew or whatever. Go open up to one of the Gospels and kind of hear the Christmas story again. That's really appropriate. Or maybe John and hear how he, he attacks it. But So I could have done that this morning and leaned into a particular spot, but I felt led to... Uh, to lean into Colossians. I can find Colossians. Chapter 2, starting at verse 6. And I'm really going to be honing in on verse 9 and 10. Um, but I'm going to start at verse 6 and run all the way through verse 15, okay? So this is a guy named Paul in the Bible writing to the church in Colossa. So there's, he's writing to a group of people at a church in Colossa. And um, this is what he says. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, uh, according to the elemental spirits of the world, or elementary principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him, in Jesus, in Christ, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. That's really key today. The whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and he put them to open shame, triumphing by triumphing, triumphing over them in him. Oh my goodness. Unbelievable. Let's pray. And I'm going to try to unpack this a little bit. Lord, I just pray that you'd come now and, and spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us, shape us, mold us, fill us, use us. Um, God, just come and um, say, say to us, speak to us what we need to hear deep into our hearts. We love you, Lord. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Last weekend, we threw a Christmas party for all of our senior leadership uh, at the, the dwelling, along with another pastor who's coming in uh, to, to, to kind of wonder about what it could look like to plant another church in the area, and uh, we'd invited another pastor from the area as well. So we had like, I don't know, there was 20-some people in our house last Sunday, and getting ready for the Christmas party 
getting ready for the Christmas party, I was uh, out mowing my lawn. I kid you not. Last Sunday, I was out mowing my lawn. For the, now, this from a Wisconsin boy, that's just weird. I'm taking like p- pictures and sending it to my family because their just minds can't wrap around it. But it was literally last Sunday when I realized that my gas tank was almost empty. And um, I, I had remembered the last time I mowed the lawn, it was like getting down there. And this baby, this gas can was almost out of, of gas too. So I go over and I'm getting ready to mow the lawn and I, I pour the last little trickle into my, my uh, lawnmower. And I'm, think, I'm looking at the amount that's in the lawnmower and I'm thinking to myself, okay, and people are coming in just a little bit and I'm thinking to myself, okay, if that runs out, I know how I am and how I can kind of get and I'm going to have to finish the lawn. You know what I mean? Like that just moment where there's like a little patch over there, that would just bother me. So I was like, I know I'm going to have to run to the gas station if I can't mow the lawn uh, with the amount of gas that's in it. And so the whole time I'm mowing my lawn, I'm thinking to myself, do I got enough gas in my lawnmower to make it through my mowing my lawn? Because I got no more gas here. And as I was kind of thinking about that a little bit this week, and as I was reflecting on Colossians, I was thinking a little bit, as we go through life, do you ever feel, do you ever kind of wonder about that? Like, do I have enough gas in the tank to finish the race? The, the race that God has marked out for me, the, the path he's got me on, the journey of faith that he's got me on, do I have enough gas to make it to the end? I think about stuff like that. You know, just like I'm sitting there mowing my lawn, do I got enough gas? Am I going to be able to finish my, my lawn? And I kind of sometimes think about that, like, I want to finish awesome. That's how I, I want to I go through life, and at the end, when I take my last breath, I want to love Jesus more than I've ever loved Jesus, and I want to tr- trust in him and believe in him with everything I got. I want to know that my family loves Jesus with everything he's got. I want to know that our congregation is, has been fed as best as we possibly can feed, and that they got as much gas in the tank as possible to make it to the end, because it's like, I just want to get to the end and hear, well done, good and faithful servant, and that's what I want to, I just want to end well, but it's like, do I got enough gas in the tank to make it. You know what I mean? Do you ever wonder about that? Do I got enough gas in the tank to make it? And you know, it's kind of appropriate to think even some of that as we're kind of coming to the end of the year a little bit. Do I got enough in the tank? Okay. I want to I wanna do a deep dive without getting too deep. But I want to talk about the two natures of Christ. And how important it is in connection to this idea of being filled with enough. That's what I want to I want to lean into. And I'll be honest with you, I've been studying some of my deepest kind of theological books this week on this thought. And I, I'm not gonna preach this the way it really needs to be preached, because I'm still kind of, I'll be I just gotta be honest with you. I'm I'm kind of still wrestling myself again. And this was stuff we wrestled with at seminary and all that stuff, but I'm still just kind of wrestling with it. But I just want to throw out there at least kind of what I got and and see if that fills you up a little bit, and then we're going to move on. But um, the two natures of Christ, here's the idea. The idea is that when, when Jesus came as a little baby, okay, that's what we're celebrating today, that when... When the Word became flesh, John chapter 1, verse 14. When the Word that has always been becomes flesh, we're now dealing with Jesus who is and has two natures. He is both God and man. And this was a real issue. Kind of early church history, there was a guy named Eutyches, and there was a guy named Nestorius who made what the church today would call heretical thoughts about Jesus. And Nestorius, and they both basically fall off the saddle on either side of the saddle. One guy falls off this way, one guy falls off this way. Nestorius kind of falls off first. Um, and Nestorius, what Nestorius wants to do 
is, is keep the, the two natures so separate that in, there's almost like he creates two persons. And then Eutyches comes along and he wants to mix them so close, the two natures, uh, both God and man, so much that he kind of blends them together. And the early church was really wrestling with this because they understood how important it was going to be to think about Jesus being both God and man. That's significant. Like Jesus, my message last night, Jesus is not just a regular good dude. There's, there's more to Jesus than just a good guy or a good moral teacher or a, a guy who can help you out in a pinch. Jesus is the God-man. He is God and man. Now, let's just look at a, just a couple. We, we could go all day on this, quite honestly. Uh, we're just not going to. Just go with me to John Chapter 8, verse 58, I just want to show you this idea that Jesus has always been God. Uh, John chapter uh, 8, verse 58. Let me go there. And we're not going to stay too long in this, guys. Just know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm talking some maybe heavy thoughts, but eh. John chapter 8, verse 58 says this. And that should be on the screen behind me. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That's before. You know, Abraham came a long time before. He's, I don't know, 2,000 some years before Jesus is saying this. And Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus has always been. And then... And again, I could go all day. We could be in the Bible all day long on this stuff. But just go with me quick to John chapter 1, verse 14. Uh, You know, I preached, I think it was last year or the year before, where we really walked through the, the gospel of John on this. But verse 14 says, And the Word, which previously in verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? Um, and then verse 14, And the Word became flesh, and came and dwelt among us. He put on flesh and blood. So he is both true God and true man, one person with two distinct natures. So why does it matter that God, Jesus, let's just say now, why does it matter that Jesus is true man? What are some things we could take from that? Well, again, I could have about 15 points here, but I'm just going to go into kind of one. Why does it matter that Jesus is a man? Well, it matters he's a man. Uh, I was thinking one of the top ones that just kind of fluttered to the top for me is he understands, he understands me. He understands humanity. He is, I mean, the, the book of Hebrews, there's a book in the Bible called Hebrews, The book of Hebrews is that Jesus is the mediator between us and God. And he's able to do that. He's able to understand exactly what you're going through because he is man. He put on flesh. He understands what it means to get uh, sick. He understands what it means to, to go through the things that you go through, the temptations you've faced. He's faced. Uh, he, he actually gets you. He's not just way out there, floaty away, you know, as some God that we kind of go and make sacrifices to or something, and then hopefully the, you know, hopefully it'll appease him. No, he has come into our world, and he understands exactly your life. He's put on flesh. He's also able, I mean, there's so many things we could do. As true man, he can die. See, God can't die. But as man, he actually can suffer and die. So that we can actually say, God died on the cross. We can actually say that. And 
Uh, he can suffer. He's been tempted. He's able to, he's able to actually, be, by putting on flesh, he's actually able to redeem flesh and restore it. This was a big deal. Look at 1 John. This is a huge deal for the early church. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. By this you know who the Spirit of God would be. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come from in the flesh is from God. This is how serious it is. This is not just a little floaty idea. Okay, maybe I can believe it, maybe I can't. Believing that Jesus has come in the flesh is, is the only thing that's of God. If, if, there's a, if there's some other thought about Jesus that would try to remove that, that's not going to be from God. That would be from um, the spiritual forces of evil that would try to twist our thinking around who Jesus is. God has come in the flesh. That's, that's all I want you to think about with Jesus is man, true man. He's also true God. What does that mean? What are some things we might glean from that idea that Jesus is true God? Now, again, another 37 points could be laid out. Let's just, one that kind of floated to the top for me is um, the, the possibility of eternal life. God has always been. God has, will always be. And so the fact that Jesus is God is so significant in that now that he's redeemed and restored, uh, redeemed mankind through his death on the cross, he's actually able to give to us in the flesh eternal life. And so we, you know, we believe this, the resurrection of the dead. Yes, new bodies. I don't understand exactly how that is or works. But we do believe, as Scripture clearly articulates, in the resurrection of the, the body to eternal life. How is that possible? That's only possible from God. That can't come from man. Do you see that? That's got to come from God. <laughs> eternal life. That's the only way. If Jesus is just a good dude who was a good teacher who lived 2,000 years ago and we miss the divinity of Christ, you miss eternal life. He's actually able to save the world. I mean, salvation, last night's message, Jesus as the Savior. Man can't do that. God has to do that. So, I don't know, I could go on for a while, but I'm just going to stop there. We believe that Jesus is true God and true man. Not 50% and 50%. He's actually 100% God and 100% man. That's, now, how that actually works, my, it honestly, it, it, it's, we're talking about the mystery of the incarnation of God. That's what we're kind of going after here. Your mind, it will actually fall short of being able to fully wrap around that. But that's what we believe to be true. That that's what Christmas is about. That God came incarnate, put on flesh. And when we look at Jesus, we see God and man. That's incredible. Um, let's just go to the text for a second. Colossians. I know I'm not I just want you to see this. Because this to me, as I was looking at different scripture verses, this just popped as like, that's it. I, I, Seth can get that. For in Christ, the whole fullness, this is verse 9. For in Christ, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. And you, now watch this. This is where you start to kind of perk your ears a little bit. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Uh, now, this Greek sentence goes kind of like this. I want you to see this. 
because this is actually important. Um, the, I, this could be better translated like this. This is going to sound a little bit funky, but it's because there's a present indicative and then there's a, there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's a passive verb that's happening, passive participle that's happening here too. And I just want you to watch this. It's, it would probably be better, you are having been filled. You are having been filled. The participle is a passive. Been, the, the filled there is a participle. You've been filled passively. You don't do anything to be filled. You've been filled passively, but then the present indicative for the verb to be there is este, which is this. You are. It's both you have been filled, but it's also still continuing to happen. And so today's message, just let me boil it down for you really fast. God has both filled you and he's filling you with himself and this is somehow, this is where it starts to get kind of, I start to like, I don't know how to say it, God. It's somehow connected to how important it is that the deity is in Christ bodily. That's it. That's all I'm saying. I don't get it exactly, but something about Christmas, something about what God has done coming into the manger as God in the flesh, so that when he... He's God. I look at Jesus and I see God. Something about that fills Seth Kunzi with everything I need and that has come and it is happening and it's just like, it's just this gas can that's flowing with gas. Everything I need is is because of what Jesus has done for me. And it's connected to this Christmas story where he is God and man. Um, I've been reading through this book a little bit, Martin Chemnitz on the Two Natures of Christ. He quotes one of the early church fathers. I just found this to be interesting. On page 149, he says this, Irenaeus says this in his Contra to Heresies. The Son of God, the Son, he capitalizes the S there. The Son of God was made the Son of Man, capital S, that man might also be made the Son of God, lowercase s. You follow that? I mean, that just that's amazing. Irenaeus, hundreds of years ago, says, The Son of God was made the Son of Man, so that man, lowercase m, might be made the lowercase son of God. Gee, you know, I preached that a couple of years ago. I remember that was a Christmas. My, my main Christmas theme was Jesus becomes like us so that we can become like him. That's amazing. That's possible because of the incarnation. I, I don't know how else to say it. Now, this is where I start to not be so theological and I just start to get into my Seth Kunziness. But it's like he bumps up against humanity so that he can kind of rub off and then he takes on humanity, sin, death, the power of the devil, and he takes that to the cross and dumps that and dies, and then he's rubbing up against humanity so that he can pass on to us righteousness and justification and salvation and eternal life. And so Jesus, the, the Christ, is rubbing off all the good stuff on us and taking all the crap from us and putting it on himself. That's what Christmas is all about in a nutshell. Now you know. Christmas, but and this is my last thought. Christmas is simply God making a way for us to be filled with himself. He makes a way so you can be filled. Let me just read that again. I'm still wrestling with this. The whole fullness of the deity dwells bodily. And then notice that. That's, a, that's the same sentence. The whole fullness of the deity, for in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and 
Kai is the Greek. You have been filled in him. Both a passive participle is used, so you don't do anything. You just get filled in him. I see him connecting this to baptism in the, the next sections here. And faith. But it's also a present indicative verb to be, which is this continuous work of God in our life too. I mean, this, the, the sentence is actually just, it's all it is is God just giving you and giving you and giving you and filling you and filling you and gracing him every, just towards you because of his incredible love for you. And that's why today, that's how I wanted to end the message is actually uh, by receiving communion. Uh, because I knew I knew that this message is going to be just out of our full brain reach. I mean, by faith, we believe it to be true. I get that. But man, there's just so much to that that's hard to wrap our minds around. And so what I wanted to do is I just wanted to take us to communion where we could just receive and be filled. To just be filled with Jesus. And, and something about the incarnation, something about him putting on flesh, and the rubbing up against and all that stuff, something about that. And then, and then as he says, as you know, the night he's betrayed, he takes the bread and he breaks it and he gives it to his disciples. And he says, take and eat, this is my, what, floaty? Is this my little floaty spiritual thing that's floating around out there? No, this is my body, which is given to you. Holy smokes. Then he takes the cup and he gives it to them. Drink from it, all of you. This is the new covenant which is now in my, what? In the little spiritual, just floaty stuff? Woo! No, in my blood, which is for you. And we just receive then his true body and his true blood. Fill, like... I already have, I'm already to the top, Lord. And he comes and he just gives it again and gives it again. And he just, we've passively been filled and then present indicative, he keeps on doing it too. And it's just, it's incredible. Wow, thank you, Lord. He loves you that much. He loves you that much. So, Again, nobody will usher you out. We got to, David's going to play a couple songs for us. Come on up and just receive, um, you know, Christ for your forgiveness, for strength, for eternal life, for salvation, for it all. I and mean, he just wants to bless you like crazy this morning, the greatest gift ever, himself for you. So um, we can receive that now. And um, yeah, if you want to take communion like as a whole family, you can come up and we'll get you a whole family. If you want to do it one at a time, it don't matter. Whenever you're ready. The first Noel The angel did say Was to certain poor shepherds In fields as they lay In fields where they Lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. Noel, 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 Noel. Born is the King of Israel. They look it up. And saw a star shining in the east beyond them far. And to the earth it gave great light. And so it continued both day and night. No Then let us 
us all with one accord. Sing praises to our heavenly Lord that hath made heaven and earth of God and with his blood mankind have brought no
So bring him incense, gold and myrrh, come peasant king to own him. The king of kings, salvation brings the loving hearts in is born the babe the son of Mary raise raise a song on high the virgin sings a lullaby joy joy for Christ is born the babe the son May this eating and this drinking of Christ's true body and blood. Notice the verbiage there, the word, or not verb, the, the, the nouns. Christ's, the God-man. Christ's true body and blood. God and man. Getting to receive that. Just think of what that does for us. Holy smokes. May that true eating and drinking strengthen you and preserve you until life everlasting. We, we actually get to finish the race because of him. Wow. Thank you, God. 